The next servant leadership attitude is the attitude of faithfulness. Faithfulness. If you're going to be a servant leader, we need to be faithful. And of course, that word means a number of different things, but let's talk about it as our attitude over a lifetime. Our attitude over a lifetime. A faithful person is a person who has a godly, servant-oriented attitude over a lifetime. In fact, one of my theories about living a godly life is basically this. Aim high and shoot long. Aim high and shoot long. It's the idea of, you know, have a a godly ambition for him, a godly obsession, a a commitment to him, which is high and big. It's It's a high standard. You want to live a godly life, but you don't want to do it for just a year or a few months or when you're young or this or that. You want to do it over a lifetime. Okay, a lifetime of, of what we consider faithfulness. Uh, there's many, many scriptures in the Bible related to uh, faithfulness. One of them is Psalm 101, verse 6, in which the psalmist says, My eyes will be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. That's God saying, hey, who do, who do I look for? I look for faithful people. Steady people. I mean, what what is faithfulness? We can define it from a number of standpoints, but I would define it as steadiness and consistency. Steadiness and consistency. The best servants are those that are dependable. You know, they're they're steady. They're consistent. Again, we're we're all human beings. We fail. We make mistakes. When we do, we need to have humility and confess those things and repent. But but we can also grow, you know, steadfastness and a consistency, you know, into our lives. I'm really grateful that even before I really gave my life to Christ, my German grandparents gave me my first Bible. And it's on my shelf at home, and I I, I love it, appreciate it a lot. They underlined a scripture in it, just one scripture in it. And this is, of course, many, many years ago. And that scripture they underlined in it was Revelation 2.10. And the older I get, the more important that scripture is to me. And Revelation 2.10 says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. That was my grandparents' aspiration for me, even before I knew the Lord, to underline in this Bible, Ron, little, little Ronnie, be faithful unto death. So there, there was kind of a sowing a seed of, will you be consistent? Will you be steady? Will you be faithful? And now let's use the, the real meaning of the word. Will you be full of faith for a lifetime? I mean, that's the word, Right. Uh, we, we kind of have changed the definition of it. Faithful meaning steady, you know, persistent. Other, and that's what it is. But it's only when you're full of faith <laughs> will you be steady, you know, consistent, dependable, that type of thing. And that's what makes us good servants. So faithfulness, again, is another aspect. We're, we're to be humble, good followers, accountable, and diligent, but also faithful. Another aspect, so the sixth aspect of servant leadership, is being a team player, being a team player player. This is your attitude toward others in leadership, your attitude toward others. When I first you know, thought about leadership, you're always kind of taught somehow that leadership is singular, you know? You're, you're a coach, he's the leader, you know? You're, you're a teacher, she's the leader, or kind of the big haunt, whoever the leader is, is the leader, and you kind of think of leadership as relatively singular. But what's interesting is that if you really get into Scripture and the Bible and the Bible's orientation toward this, of course, what I'm teaching you is, is God's view of leadership, not the world's view, not, not that view, but the, God's view of leadership, of course, begins with a team. The Trinity is a team. We're not talking about one. We're talking about one in essence, but we're actually talking about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's actually shared leadership. So all team leadership or group leadership really goes back to the very essence of the Trinity, where you have three in one, loving each other, serving each other, having various roles, and in that sense being one God in a mysterious way we can't understand, but it's a beautiful thing. Again, all concepts of love come out of that, out of the the relationships of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all concepts of leadership come out of it too. The best leadership is not singular. The best leadership is shared. And again, the Bible is kind of very clear on this. And in the the best portions of Scripture where you see leadership being occupied, you see Jesus himself, for example, with his disciples. He he wasn't a lone gun. He's he's with others. He's giving responsibility to them. 
And in, the, and in the early church days, it was very much an aspect of team camaraderie. And I want to give you a little scripture in Acts 15, verse 28, where it just kind of gives you the, 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 the spirit of leadership behind the early church. It wasn't just, you know, Peter, you know, dictating because he's the ultimate authority. When they made actually their first decision that kind of affected the early church and its, uh, the ramifications of the gospel going to the Gentiles and all that, and they sent that letter, remember the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15? where it talks about, they wanted to know kind of what, what do we say to the Gentile believers who are not Jewish? And so they ended that letter by saying this. This is actually Acts 15, verse 28. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. They told them just a few things, and then they ended the letter by basically saying, you know what, we're, we're in unity with the Holy Spirit, and, and our leadership is in us. <laughs> This is not, you know, a dictate from Peter from on high or something like that. There was, they were demonstrating the aspect that leadership should be shared, and the more it is shared. This is why a lot of churches in the last 20 or 30 years have gotten away from top-down, uh, you know, leadership and have gotten more to elderships and shared responsibility because that's more of a biblical model of leadership. That good leadership is balanced, especially in the human world where you have different gifts and there's always a role for a person being kind of the final arbiter of that. And in your family, you need to have that. In fact, in church history, we call that the term primus inter pairs, first among equals. And a lot of our elder boards, there's a person who's kind of ultimately responsible or guides the whole thing, and we call them the, the primus inter pairs, the first among equals. But the overall concept of leadership is team is good. Differing gifts is good. Submission to one another is good. Working in tandem is good. And you find it as a tremendous model of servant leadership in Scripture. It starts right in the Trinity itself. Number seven, another aspect of servant leadership is the idea of <clears throat> discipling others as a major goal in life. Training, mentoring, discipling others. Which is really your attitude toward the future. Your attitude toward the future. If you are a good leader and a good servant leader... It's not about you giving dictates or even you getting glory. It's really a matter of you serving people. And just like a parent should be for their children, you wanting them to do better than you. And you actually looking forward to passing the baton to them to where you even step out of certain realms of leadership because your whole philosophy is, wow, I want to hand this off. This is not about me and my position for life. It's, it's really about developing you to where, as John the Baptist actually said about his relationship to Jesus, this is John 3, verse 30, he must increase, I must decrease. That is a great attitude of a leader. Others must increase and I must decrease. You know, if I'm really going to be a good leader of this study group, home group, or of this church, it'd be kind of nice if I just kind of faded in the background because I trained them so well that the baton was passed on to another generation of leaders. That's really the, the, the godly concept, which is also why Paul said so much in his letters about, you know, train others, pass on to faithful people, like 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, that they may teach others also. So if we are to be servant leaders, it's not a matter of enjoying our position, and just staying in that position. And actually in our organization, one of the reasons that the organization I served in has continued to grow and grow and grow over the years is at a point in time, a lot of the leaders stepped out. They stepped away. You, you gotta actually get out of the way so others can grow up into leadership because you want expansion. And expansion does not come when you stay at the top of the pyramid, stopping all the flow of everything else. You actually want there to be multiplication. And so discipling others, turning it over to others, again, not being so in love with your position that you want to stay there, that's not your attitude. The attitude is, wow, if I can train somebody else to do better than I'm doing, I want to decrease. I want to kind of just fade into oblivion and let others, that's the attitude of the Godhead in terms of servant leadership. And the final one then, the, the eighth quality of a servant leader, and this is a big one, uh, this one's really important to me, is a servant leader has no desire for position or status has no desire for position or status. And this, this really is your attitude toward power, which I said, and has been said in the worldly context, power tends to corrupt in absolute power, absolutely. But it's your attitude toward power. You have no desire for position or status. 
I can actually drive into a corporate headquarters or into a church facility and see certain things stand out to me as to whether they really understand this one. If I see a special parking place, say, reserved for the pastor, I wonder about that a little bit. If I see the CEO or the leader having the nicest office in the building, in the tower, or in the room with the view, that says something to me about that. Because real servant leadership is not about perks or the trappings of power. And again, Jesus was the one that destroyed the worldly model in that one because he wanted nothing to do with that, which we, which we read in uh, Philippians chapter 2. And we also read it in, in Luke 22, which we're, where, we, <clears throat> where we started out, where Jesus said, hey, in the world, the worldly leaders, they like their positions. They like their name on their lapel. They like the name on the door. They like the biggest office. They like the parking place. It's all about the perks. It's the trappings of power, the insignias of power. And Jesus said, but you are not to be like them. I'm here as the one who serves. I, I wear just a, a normal cloak. I, I don't have any trappings of power. None of those things. J Jesus just obliterated this aspect of leadership is about being seen as bigger or better than others with more perks. Now, again, it's another aspect for us to honor leaders by giving them things. It's an, that's our idea of we need to bless those who, who serve. But if a leader ever gets you know, pretty happy and satisfied about his special parking place and, and better office and everything else, the power's gotten to his head. That is no longer servant leading. Jesus never led in that way. In fact, we're, let's finish by very quickly talking about how Jesus was the perfect servant leader in all eight of these qualities. Number one, Jesus was humble. God is humble. He even said, come to me, all you are weary and, and burdened, I will give you rest. That's Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Jesus said he had a humble heart. That's servant leadership. Number two, Jesus was a good follower. John 5, 19 is an example of that. Jesus said this, the son could do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son does. In other words, he's totally under authority. I'm not a loose cannon. I don't do things on my own. That's John 5, 19. He said, I, I look at the Father and I follow him. That's what made him a great leader. Again, totally under authority. Looking at the Father, what the Father did, he did. Number three, Jesus was accountable, totally accountable. John 17, 4. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. John 17, 4. Totally sense of accountability. I came to the earth for a reason. Father, I did it. I did it. I glorified you by doing what you asked me to do. Total accountability. Jesus was also diligent. One thing I love about the book of Mark is in the book of Mark, which is an action-oriented book, you find the word immediately, immediately, immediately. Immediately Jesus did this, and immediately he did that, and immediately did this. In fact, he immediately did so many things, he uh, fell asleep in a boat in which there was a storm. And they also said at various times that you don't even have time to eat. Don't you want to, you know, don't you want to eat? So there's tremendous diligence. Jesus did not waste time. He, he took his time and his labor and was totally diligent in all that he did. Number five, Jesus was faithful, totally faithful. Hebrews 3, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your eyes on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. So Jesus, of course, aimed totally high and went long with total consistency, full of faith, steadiness, he was faithful. Number six, he was a team player. He didn't come to the earth and just say, here I am, I'm the Messiah, just do my thing. He lived and slept with the disciples. He made himself available to children. He was a total team player, sent them out in pairs. They represented him. He had this team attitude because he came from a team called the Trinity. Number seven, he was totally committed to discipling others. He discipled the three, Peter, James, and John. The 12, the disciples, the 70. He was totally committed to multiplying and finally dying and leaving. So in, in being not even seen on the earth, they could go beyond and he said even do greater works than, than, than I would do. And number eight, he also had no desire for position or status. 
no desire for position or status. Just want to read to you a, a quote from my leadership book here, the scripture, and a conclusion that comes with it. The book says, finally, the servant leadership of Jesus is seen in his total unconcern for position, status, or rank. That lesson he taught to his disciples in bold and living color. Now here it is, John 13. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he'd come forth from the Father and was going back to God, he rose from supper and he laid aside his garments, taking a towel, girded himself about, then he poured water into the basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he was girded. And when he had washed their feet and taken his, his, taken his garments, we put them back on, and reclined at table, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. And if I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you all also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, neither one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And I said here in the, in the book, by that one act, Jesus destroyed for all time any concept of leadership that smacks of power and position grabbing. He had every reason to command both rank and status before his disciples, but he knew the essence of leadership. It is service to others. True leadership is measured by how many people you serve, not how many people you control. By washing their feet, he showed his disciples the way God himself leads the world. He does it by serving. His followers are to do the same. He said that he gave us an example, and we would be blessed if we do likewise. <laughs>